Today is a really special interview. For retirees, people who worry about their savings, people who understand China is continuing to steer the world towards de-dollarization. This is a must-listen interview. John Rubino is one of the most important market commentators on YouTube. This is our first interview release of 2019 because Portfolio Wealth Global believes the U.S. dollar is going to drop dramatically in the years ahead. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash drama. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. The months of October, November, and December have been some of the most dramatic for stocks since 2008. In fact, sentiment data reads about the same. This has actually been a very unique year also because the United States dollar has actually been the best performing asset of 2018. So it is very appropriate to be welcoming back today guest, Mr. John Rubino. John is the founder of DollarCollapse.com, and he has a history of explaining very complicated financial matters in very simple terms. For that reason, we've made a compilation of important forecasts, ideas, and strategies that Mr. Rubino has mentioned over his distinguished career. Everyone can go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash John to download this free exclusive report. No other channel has ever put this together, and it is an eye-opener to really look at the underlying problems of the United States dollar. John, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Hey, Michelle. Good to talk to you again. Oh, it's amazing to have you here. We're always honored to welcome you. We Hmm. want to start off with a question about this. With everything that is going on, so many analysts are saying that it is still not time to short that the economic machine of the United States is moving forward in giant strides, that we are an empire and an example to the rest of the world. So it begs the question, what is the difference between prosperity and possibly the illusion of prosperity? Well, well there, there are two different things we have to touch on to answer this question. The first is the, the underlying reality um, of the U.S. And, and really the whole global economy is that we're taking on more and more debt year after year. So you can create the illusion of prosperity in your personal life or um, for a country or for a global economy by borrowing lots of money and spending it uh, because that generates growth in the moment and it creates jobs and it makes things look like they're perking right along and, and that we're actually in pretty good shape. But the underlying reality is that we're taking on more and more debt which makes us more and more fragile. Just as if you were maxing out a new credit card every couple of weeks yourself, you know, you, your neighbors would think you were doing great because they'd see all the stuff that you were buying with that, that credit. But under the surface, your financial life would be deteriorating. And that's what's happening right now in, in the US, but also Europe, Japan, China, and a lot of other places uh, where everybody's borrowing a lot of money and spending it. And the Headline numbers because of that are not so bad, but the the real number that you got to look at is total debt to GDP. And that's getting worse and worse and worse. So in in that sense, we're we're heading off a cliff. We don't know when we will come to the edge of that cliff, but that cliff is out there and it it comes in the form of some kind of a debt crisis in the not too distant future. Now, the other thing that's important to understand is that um, the the recent numbers Mm -hmm. have been okay, but volatility has been spiking in the financial markets. In other words, stocks go way up one day and way down the next day. And, and it's been dramatic, stuff. right? It's just yeah, very dramatic. And, and this is the kind of thing that tends to happen towards the end of a long bull market in an asset class, whether it's equities or bonds or whatever. You get um, a topping process that, that presents as volatility. People can't figure out what to do anymore because should you buy as soon as something goes down or should you sell as, something, as soon as something goes up? And so you've got the buy the dip people and the sell the rip people out there in the marketplace kind of um, contending for the future trend in the financial marketplace. Uh, and which is why we get, you know, 300 points down one day, 500 points down up the next day in, in the Dow Jones Industrial and the other um, equity indexes in the U.S. Um, that happened in 2007 and early 2008, and it preceded a huge drop in the market. So this feels like that to me. And it doesn't mean that it will be that. It means that... Um, 
that we're, we're repeating a pattern that took place one cycle ago and led to a huge drop in stock prices. So if, you know, if history repeats, bad times are coming in the financial markets in 2019. That's very interesting that you're seeing a pattern. Oh, it's, it's very much like um, 2007, 2008. Um, this, this happened almost according to, uh, you know, an identical script back then to what's happening now. So yeah, it feels very familiar. Uh, but but that's, that can be a trap sometimes because history doesn't repeat perfectly. You know, just because something feels like something that happened before doesn't mean it's going to um, proceed like whatever happened before. But, uh, you know, when, when the big um, bear market that inevitably follows a huge bull market comes, it's going to start like this. It's going to feel like this. So people... Um, who are trying to decide what to do with their capital ought to be very concerned about this. They, they might not want to panic. We won't know that until retrospect. There are times to panic. <laughs> and this might be one of those times, but we, we won't know that until after the fact. We'll look back and say, oh yeah, October 2018, that's when I should have mortgaged the house and shorted every stock in the market with yep. the proceeds. You know? and, but we're always dealing with incomplete information in the moment. Uh, so I'll just say that this feels like the last time we had a big crisis, and it could turn out to be that, but it could turn out to be something very different. So um, caution is in order, but probably not flat out blind panic just yet. Caution, but not panic. Now, you mentioned China and Japan, which is very interesting. Brings me to my next question. The United States has had no problem so far getting China and Japan, as well as the American people and virtually every institution in the world to agree to lend money on the federal level. And it's been called the risk-free yield. Although Tom Beck, the founder of Portfolio Wealth Global, calls it the treasury bond yield free risk. Tom believes that the coupon holders could actually see a greater loss than homeowners did back in 2008. Tom published what has turned out to be a widely acclaimed report that shows exactly what to avoid and the alternatives for income investors. That free report for everyone is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash bonds. So John, why is there seemingly such an overwhelming demand for what clearly is not the best investment at this moment in time? Are we in a bonds bubble right now? What are your thoughts? Oh, we are absolutely in a bond bubble. This is um, the longest run um, of, of lower and lower bond yields and higher and higher bond prices that has ever taken place. It began in the, the 1980s and continued until just this year. Um, and that's convinced a lot of people that bonds will always go in that direction. Although lately, you know, we, we've seen interest rates start to go up and we've seen bonds start to underperform the market. So it could be that we're at the end of that cycle too, which would coincide with the end of the stock cycle. Um, the reason that the dollar remains strong um, is that, well, two reasons. One is just history. You know, we've had the world's reserve currency since World War II. And old habits die hard. People have uh, this ingrained idea that the dollar is the safest place to put your money. Even while we've been borrowing huge amounts of money and, and overspending at the federal level and encouraging everybody else to borrow huge amounts of money, and, and in that way making the dollar fundamentally weaker and weaker year after year. Um, so this is kind of the remnant of an old system that's no longer in place. You know, the, the dollar is still seen as the world's main reserve asset. It's still seen as the safest asset, uh, but the fundamentals don't support that anymore. So at some point in the future, people will figure out that it's the explicit policy of the UF, U.S. government to make the dollar worth less and less every year, which means it's not a good thing to hold anymore if you're looking for long-term stability of purchasing power. In other words, you, if you want to put your money somewhere uh, and maybe come back to it 10 years later in the expectation that it'll be worth just as much, the dollar is not the, uh, the place for you anymore. Uh, and when something like that happens, you know, old habits die hard, but it, that works both ways. Um, it takes a long time for people to change their minds, but once they change their mind, uh, they, they tend not to change back uh, for a very long time, and they require a lot of evidence to the contrary to, to make them go back to the old way of thinking. So when people lose faith in a currency, 
it tends to be a really dramatic change in marketplace behavior. Uh, in, in the Austrian School of Economics, there's a thing called the crack-up boom, which is the point at which a critical mass of people lose faith in a currency and decide whenever they get that currency to spend it right away on real stuff that governments can't make more of. Uh, and so you see the value of the currency plunge and the price of lots of stuff go up. And, and that's not you know, inflation as we classically think of it. It's actually a collapse in faith in the currency. <clears throat> and when that happens, it's very hard to win that faith back. Uh, and the US, along with the other big countries in the world, are all creating conditions for something like that in their currencies. Uh, it's not clear who leads that process down. It could be the Japanese yen very easily, it could be the Chinese yuan, it could be the euro, it could be the dollar. So we don't know who will collapse first. But it's, it's highly probable that um, no matter what we do in the future, just based on the damage we've done to the, the fundamentals of these big currencies in the past, that they'll start to go down and they'll start to go down faster and then people will lose faith and they'll just tank. Uh, and then the question becomes, where do you hide out if the big currencies of the world are losing value and nobody wants them anymore? And that, that's the really interesting intellectual challenge that I, that I think investors are going to have to grapple with over the next few years. Right. Right. Now, John, in light of the stock market action during the last quarter of this year, even going back to September, Tom has made the connection between the sell-off of the FANG stocks and the implosion of the cryptocurrency markets. Now, we know many gold and silver advocates who switched over to crypto last year thinking this was the new safe haven. And now Bank of America puts the price tag of gold at its high in 2019 at 13 to 1400 dollars in other words they're bearish on the dollar we want to get your full perspective on this we know it's hard to cover your full expertise in one interview so we want to remind everyone that they can check out john's full body of work at portfoliowealthglobal.com slash john but for the moment in a simple nutshell because i know this is an expansive question but what would lead to a dollar sell-off? Because right now the Federal Reserve is the only central bank paying normal yields. Yeah, okay, well here, here's what would do it in the general terms. There will be a crisis. Now that could be um, an equities bear market. In other words, stocks just plunging with no end in sight, or it could be a crisis somewhere else in the world. You know, France right now has some stuff going on that is liable to, uh, or at least could possibly cause a financial crisis with that country. Italy is going broke at an accelerating rate. So Europe and the Eurozone and the European Union, um, they, they all face crises that could come back here and spook us. Um, China is another um, possible crisis in the world, Japan, et cetera, or some war somewhere. In other words, there are a lot of things that could happen that – um, lead the U.S. government to decide it needs to cut interest rates dramatically and increase federal spending dramatically. So we'll get massive deficits, you know, $2 trillion a year in deficits in response to this crisis. And we'll get the Fed pushing interest rates back down at an accelerating rate. You know, I think next time in, in the next cycle, we'll see not only zero interest rates from the Fed, but negative interest rates, like a lot of the world saw in the Great Recession of a few years ago. And when that happens, then all of a sudden, uh, holding dollar denominated assets looks a lot less interesting, right? Because uh, if something not only doesn't pay you any yield, but you have to pay for the privilege of investing in it with a negative yielding bond, um, it's less interesting to do, you know, so you put your money somewhere else and the dollar falls. Uh, and, and that could happen in the next few years or can happen much sooner than that if stocks continue to tank. You know, if we get a, a, a dramatic bear market in stocks, you'll see the government respond to it right away because they're terrified of what something like that will do to the rest of the financial markets. Uh -huh. um, and in that case, money will flow into real assets. In other words, people will, will be shy about financial assets. They won't trust them anymore. So dollars and bonds and uh, anything related to currencies like bank accounts won't look good anymore. But real things like oil wells and farmland and, and good rental property and gold and silver will all go up. Uh, so I, I think that's the main story of the next few years is the shift from financial assets into real assets and, and which real assets turn out to be the best um, players in that new market. Hmm, interesting. Now, John, 
Do you invest in the stock market? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you focus on? Just getting personal here. <laughs> I'm sure everybody wants to know, what do you personally? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I tend to be less of a stock picker than more of a, a kind of a, a macro theme investor where uh, I, I think some big thing is going to happen. And, and so I'll buy stocks or in a lot of cases, short stocks mm. based on this big theme. And mm. for the last few years, the, my, my big theme has been that uh, U.S. stocks would fall and gold and silver and the mining stocks that mine gold and silver would go up. That's been a really bad idea for, for quite a while now. But it's starting to work out just lately as a lot of the, you know, the big tech stocks, like you, you mentioned, the FANG stocks, are really plunging. And gold and silver are kind of finding a bottom and starting to go up a little bit. And that's taking some of the mining stocks with it. So if we have a, um, if we have a year in which the thesis of sell stocks and buy precious metals works out, you'll see the mining stocks just rocket because they're so cheap right now. And you'll see um, gold go up and silver go up even more because silver has gotten really cheap. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, I need to qualify that by saying right. I, I thought that three years ago was the big play. It didn't <laughs> work. But right. it still feels like the, um, the way to set things up if you're, you know, fairly aggressive, because if you're going to be shorting things out there, mm -hmm. you kind of have to know what you're doing and you have to have a sense of how that works and what the risks are. So for a lot of people, it's not the right thing to try at home, but buying gold and silver a little at a time and storing it safely and buying high quality mining stocks, that's a, a more understandable, easier to do and, and still potentially really profitable Hmm. bet right now. Hmm. Now, what are the various manners by which the federal government can monetize the debt? Well, the, the general way that they do it is by creating a lot of new currency and then, hmm. you know, used to call it printing money, but now they don't print very much physically anymore. They just move computer impulses around. You they know, create you, it digitally. <laughs> right? Yeah, you have, you have a guy at the Fed type in a trillion dollars uh, and then put um, J.P. Morgan Chase's address in the uh, the send area, and then click send. And and J.P. Morgan Chase's reserves are increased by that amount. And then presumably they lend that money out to businesses, and and, uh, and the economy grows. That's the theory behind it, and that's the mechanism behind it. So it's very easy. And to uh, you know, so the government now it's just play money. It's just make believe because there's no physical reality to any of this. They don't have to go get gold from somewhere else in order to increase the money supply. They just make it up. And think about the temptation that that creates. You know, what we've done is given the world's governments basically unlimited credit cards. And they're human beings. You know, given human nature, when you've got an unlimited line of credit with really no downside, at least in the moment, of course you're going to abuse that privilege, right? And that's what everybody's doing. <clears throat> and that's what we'll do next time around. We will take our unlimited credit card and we will max it out in order to keep stocks from tanking or the bond market from imploding or, or to fight the next war or to bail out Europe or Japan or China. You know, we'll, we'll do something with <clears throat> trillions of dollars that we make up out of thin air. And then the question is, how does the market react to that? You know, and I, I tend to think it'll react badly. <laughs> You know, I think most people don't realize they envision printing currency as literally printing currency, which it was back in the day, but now it's not. It's just a stroke of a button and you add billions, trillions, mm -hmm. you know, which is quite frightening when you're actually aware of um, what it's doing to our dollar. Yeah, um, especially when, when you haven't seen that happen in the marketplace yet. You know, the, the dollar and the other big fiat currencies remain valuable in the world. People still think they have value, right. while the guys managing them are, are screwing up on a, an absolutely biblical scale. You know, they're making mistakes that, that have never been made in the history of finance, and they're doing it together on a global scale. So, um, 
but from their point of view, think how much fun it must be to um, to run the Fed or the Treasury Department. You yeah, it's like money. Monopoly, literally. Yeah, you said. <laughs> it's like, wow. Who would give up your power? I want to buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. exactly. You know, think think if someone gave you an unlimited credit card, how you you control yourself for a little while, then eventually you just let fly. You'd be buying things and and helping all your friends and punishing your enemies. Um, that's the nature of our governments today. They they've got this power that they can use to do extraordinary things and they're, they've been corrupted by it. They're out there, they're doing extraordinarily bad things with, uh, with their unlimited credit card. And the American people don't even call them on it. Really? No, nobody, because nobody calls them. Because we perceive them to be acting in our interest a lot of the time. If, um, if, if there's a, a financial problem out there and the government steps in and bails everybody out, people are grateful for that. They think that, uh, you know, they deserve to be bailed out and the government is their friend. What they don't realize is that in the process of bailing them and everybody else out, the government is systematically destroying the currency that's in their bank accounts and, and in their wallets um, and in their um, retirement funds uh, when that reality comes home. In other words, you know, to go back to the credit card analogy, it, it's great when you're spending it, but when the bill comes, it's less fun, right? And, and that's still to be seen. You know, we, we haven't seen the bill come due yet. But when it does come due, uh, the longer we've been able to go on with this thing, the bigger the bill will be and the harder it will be to pay off. It's, it's really impossible to pay off now. There's, there's no way we could come up with actual wealth on the scale that it would take to pay off our debts. So we have some kind of a crisis out there that wipes out those debts somewhere in the future. Uh, and, and, and the question is, which kind of a crisis will, will it be? A 1930s style depression where everybody goes bankrupt or a, um, a hyperinflation like Weimar Germany had in the 20s and like we almost had in the 1970s, where the currency collapses and, um, and debts become easier to pay off because you're paying it off in, in money that's worth way less than it used to be. Uh, which is great for you if you're paying off debts, but terrible for the people who expected to be paid off in full, you know, and, and we'll see which of those happens. Right now we're leaning towards the inflation scenario. Um, and if we're capable of pulling it off, that's what we'll go for. Mm. Now, John, Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates, which is the largest hedge fund in the world, believes that President Trump's policies are isolating America from its creditors, which may lead to the path of printing more currency in the coming years. Ray is very bearish on the dollar, and BlackRock's founder has warned that the Trump administration's policies are antagonizing to creditors who fund 40% of our national deficit. Do you feel that our president's attitude of taking no prisoners is beneficial or is it going too far? Well, it's, it's definitely a high risk strategy. Um, some of what he's trying to do, uh, especially with China, is completely valid. China cheats <laughs> in a lot of ways on, on trade. Um, and for President Trump to try to redress some of those issues is reasonable. But as you said, um, there are creditors. China and Japan and Saudi Arabia own a lot of US debt, which means they've lent us a lot of money. So you kind of have to tread carefully when you're, when you're thinking about crossing the people that you owe a lot of money to because they have weapons that can hurt you. You know, they could dump all, all their treasury holdings which would spike interest rates in the US and maybe throw us into a, an even deeper recession than the one that's probably coming. Um, so we don't want to, um, to cause that to happen. And what we're doing, you know, creates the possibility for something like that to happen. So I don't know. President Trump seems to be comfortable with high risk gambles. And that's what makes him really unusual as a US president. Usually um, um, they, they're very cautious in a lot of what they do because there are huge risks out there and Trump doesn't really seem to worry about those risks. So we'll, we'll see, you know, it's a, it's a unique time and these are unique policies that are, he's pursuing. So we can't really say with any kind of certainty what, what they'll turn out to be or do. Yeah, he's a big change, but it's almost good to have a change because what has led us down this path has been the same old thing, same old thing, same old thing. So now we are at, um, 
a really big danger zone right now. And so Trump coming in, whether he's bad or good, he's a lot different. And the truth is we couldn't keep going the same way. So it's interesting for his perspective as a businessman um, to come in and sort of, you know, John Wayne it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, business as usual was not going to work. No. We, we doubled the national debt under the Republicans with George W. Bush, and then we doubled it again under um, President Obama. Um, so it's kind of a bipartisan mess that we've got going right now. And standard policy fixes aren't going to help at all. Not that I think there are any policy fixes that will save us, but the old ones won't work. You know, you're kind of seeing what's happening in France right now where they – they elected where a lot of Europe was going for populists of the right or left, you know, people from the outside coming in with new ideas. They elected a guy who was totally mainstream, who was going to do basically um, exactly what the, the mainstream political parties would have done and did do in the past. And he did it all. And now you Paris is on fire. You know, there, there are people in the streets setting cars on fire and burning stores and, and thousands of people are being arrested because business as usual did not work there. And I, I think that's true pretty much everywhere now. You, you can't stay the course if the course is taking you off a cliff. Exactly. Exactly. Well put. Now, John, from your perspective, how severe is the wealth gap in the United States? And can you provide us with some examples or some statistics to illustrate your thoughts? Because it's hard to visualize the problem for people who don't actually study this social phenomenon really is what it's become. Okay, let, let's set up how this happened because that's I think the really interesting story. Uh, back in, in 1971, we went off the gold standard in the US which is what gave us that unlimited credit card I've been talking about. So after that, all currencies were just fiat currencies, which is to say they exist by government decree or fiat, and governments could make as much new money as they wanted to. Um, and the, the way our system works is the Federal Reserve creates new currency and puts it in the banking system. It gives it to the big banks, who then take that money and use it to help their big clients, so rich people in other words. So the government creates new money, um, gives it to the banks who give it to the rich people who then use it to create new wealth for themselves. And that has caused an increase in wealth for rich people, obviously. Um, and it takes a really long time for any of that to percolate down to the, the bottom 50% of the, uh, the income ladder in the U.S. So you see the rich get richer year after year after year relative to everybody else. And that creates the wealth gap that you're talking about. So you, you end up with just a tiny handful of people, let's say the 1% richest people in the US now own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of people in the US. And that happens historically. And it always ends badly. Okay, that, that happened in the 1920s, we had this huge disparity of wealth between the rich and poor. And then we had the Great Depression. Um, and World War Two, you know, it was 20 horrendous years. Uh, that we lived through, in part because of this huge disparity between the rich and poor, which led the poor to uh, to take extreme measures to get back some of what's theirs. And, and you're seeing that happen all around the world now, right. uh, which could easily lead to, you know, a, a peasants with pitchforks and torches kind of scenario. Uh, a, a lot of people like to use the French Revolution as um, the metaphor for what we're heading for. And in, in, at that time, they had a tiny aristocracy that ran everything for their own benefit. Everybody else was poor. And finally, the people who were not the aristocrats just rose up, um, went and got the aristocrats and cut their heads off, you know? And, and hopefully, the, uh, the analogy is only financial this time, you know, that we, we have a, a financial revolution of some sort where we reset the currency um, to a, a more sustainable kind of system without chopping heads off. But, you know, you never know when things really get going. Look, look what's yeah. happening in France now. They're burning big chunks of Paris. Uh, and it, it's not a stretch to say that the financial version of that is highly likely. And it could take the form of Bern, President Bernie Sanders, who comes in and raises taxes on every rich person to levels that haven't been seen, you know, since... Um, mid 20th century Europe or someplace uh, where, where, you know, in Britain one year, they put a 105% marginal tax rate on high incomes. In other words, if you made a lot of money, you only you had to give it all to the government plus five more percent. Um, our far left in the US 
would love to try would love that right that's really what they want and you get enough people who are dissatisfied with the rich people's behavior in a country and they're liable to vote for something like that so yeah that's one way this could play out and that's the you know the least violent way it could play out so i i don't know if i I wouldn't call that the best way though because that's not (laughs) a good system that that only lasts for a little while before it collapses when you have something like that now talk to us a little bit you brought up france and talk to us a little bit about what is happening there right now and the reason for the i believe they're calling it the yellow vest uh Mm -hmm. revolt um because they've really uh they're really angry i don't know if our audience who isn't familiar with this yet they're really they're in the streets they're um really gone up very very Mm -hmm. strong against the police they can't even be restrained it seems well france has a system where they've they've tried to make things very egalitarian very cushy for working people but at a cost of companies not wanting to hire anybody anymore because they can't fire anybody. So it kind of backfired on them. So they have very high unemployment and they have extremely high taxes. Uh, I saw a headline the other day that that said, France is now the highest tax country in Europe, which is saying something, you know, because Europe has a lot of high tax countries. Um, And they've, um, they've responded to a demographic problem. In other words, they're not having enough babies to create a, to produce enough workers in the future to pay for the really generous retirement benefits they've granted all their future retirees. So they've been um, opening the doors to, um, to huge numbers of immigrants, which has kind of destabilized the country too. So you put all that together and you get a lot of frustrated people. Um, Macron, the new um, French president, comes in and starts raising taxes again. You know, he, he raised, for instance, gas taxes, which hits people who have to commute, even though gas taxes are already extremely high in France. And, and so that set off the protests. And, uh, but, but it wasn't just the gas taxes. It was all the other frustrations um, that, you know, created a powder keg and, and the gas tax was just the thing that lit the fuse. So now the government is trying to deal with a whole bunch of different demands on the part of the people who are in the streets. And right now it's responding with tax cuts and, uh, and higher spending on social programs, um, which creates bigger deficits, which leads the, um, you know, the, the French economy closer to that cliff we've been talking about. So that won't fix anything, but that's how they're responding. Um, so there's, there's no way out of something like that that's pain-free. It's just a question of which kind of pain you choose. And France is going for the inflationary kind of pain, where the government creates a lot of new currency, tosses it out there, hopes that makes people happy in the moment, and then worries about what happens to the currency later. Um, Which is exactly what we're doing. Yeah, it's what everybody does. No, yep. Nobody does anything different now. They start out with ideas about controlling spending and, and um, austerity and getting the budget balanced and everything, but that makes so many people so mad that they end up having to switch gears almost instantly <laughs> and go back to big deficits and, and easy money. So yes, everybody's doing it. And the end result of that historically is a currency collapse. Wow. Now, quick prediction for us. Currency collapse, you see it coming for everyone. When do you think it's gonna start? When or where? When when and where? Okay, well, I I thought um, 2006 was pretty much the end of this system. So Mm -hmm. you you have to take anything I say about timing with a big grain of salt because Um, This has gone on a lot longer than I thought it could, which means the fact that I think we're headed for another crisis in the near term um, might or might not be right. That's what it feels like to me. But I've I've been wrong in my my thoughts about how long we can keep this going in the past. Which is actually frightening because we're probably right on the verge of it then. Maybe. (laughs) feels like it, <laughs> but they might have some other tricks up their sleeve. Uh, they, they mm-hmm. did some extraordinary things last time around that didn't seem possible with their unlimited credit cards. And maybe they'll, they'll try something again like that. I mean, I, I think the next time um, there's a crisis, we will go bigger than we went last time. In other words, we'll bail out the big banks with even more money. We will cut interest rates even further. We'll create even more new currency and use that to buy back a broader range of assets. The government might start buying back stocks at some point here, uh, which that, that changes the financial markets in ways that 
uh, that are unpredictable because we've never seen it done on that scale before. So it's hard to know exactly how this plays out, but none of it is good. None of this stuff is, is positive or has a high chance of fixing anything. This is all just desperation at the end of a long run that uh, will either fail miserably or so succeed for a little while and make the eventual crisis that much worse. So that's, that's going to be the story of 2008, of 19, 2020. Yeah. You know, the government's flailing around, trying um, ineptly to fix something that can't be fixed. But you believe that they'll come up with new solutions. Now, what, what currency do you think will fail first? Just See, that's, that's a, a big question that's yeah. really unanswerable right now because everybody's made such horrendous mistakes. Really? Um, Everyone's they, in the they, same they, position. You know, 10 people on your street all maxing out credit cards at the same time. Who's going to oh. go into bankruptcy first? You have no idea. But somebody's going to, and then uh, somebody else is going to follow them. And that's the global financial system right now. Um, if you look at any major country, you can spend five minutes just going over the horrendous problems they've created for themselves. Oh, my. Um, and that includes Germany, believe it or not, which is this you know, seemingly rock-solid country. But if we had more time, I could, I could tell you why you should be terrified of what Germany is going to go through in the next few years. Um, but China is a mess. Japan is a mess. We are a huge mess. Um, a lot of the emerging markets um, borrowed a bunch of dollars in the last few years, trillions of dollars, thinking that their currencies would continue to go up versus the dollar. And the opposite happened. The currency started to fall versus the dollar. And now they can't pay off their dollar debts because the dollar is worth so much more relative to their currencies that a lot of them are going to go bankrupt. It goes on and on. <laughs> now, having said all that, this is, I mean, it's, it's a pessimistic, scary story from the point of view of macroeconomics, but it's also an optimistic story from the point of view of investing. You know, this is an investment thesis. When there's a big crisis, some things go down and some things go up. So our challenge is to find the things that go up in the kind of world we've created for ourselves. There's the money question, to be made in this, isn't there, John? Oh, somebody or some group of people are going to make billions of dollars. They're going to be household names with the fortunes that they make by timing this perfectly. Um, but that's almost a random thing, right? 90% of the people who try to time this will get it wrong. <laughs> right. And they might make some money, but they won't make you know, insane amounts of money. So what, what we want to do as individuals is protect ourselves mostly from this. Don't try to quadruple your net worth in this kind of a crisis because if you time it wrong, you'll cut your net worth commensurately um, uh, down. Um, but you can protect yourself by buying stuff that will tend to hold its value through, through a crisis like that. Historically, gold and silver have been the best things. You, know, you can go all the way back to the Roman Empire uh, when they had a hyperinflation. And gold and silver did just fine. You know, if you had those things, you barely noticed that the, uh, the official currency was collapsing. And that has been true through wars and natural disasters and financial crises ever since. So there's no reason to think it won't happen again this time, that gold and silver won't hold their value through what's coming. So that's, that's the bedrock, I think, of a, a wisely structured financial life right now. There's a lot of precious metals put away in a safe place and... Um, and left alone to do their thing while the rest of the world spins out of control. Uh, John, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everybody how to follow your work. Well, I, I run dollarcollapse.com, which is a website that's updated daily and it covers stuff like this. You know, it, it, it'll um, tune you into the dark side of the global financial system. <laughs> the dark side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. It's always great to have you, Mr. John Rubino, the founder of DollarCollapse.com and whose work and expertise are covered in our special report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash John. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 2019 is beginning, and to end 2018, we had explosive interviews released with Trace Mayer, John Rubino, Jeffrey Tucker, Gerald Salente, Jim Rogers, Carl Denninger, and Jerry Robinson. PortfolioWealthGlobal.com has had an amazing 2018, and we're going to continue to over-deliver this year with up-to-date content and by publishing exclusive information in the newsletter that we don't publish anywhere else. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash money. 